Well, good afternoon, folks. My name is Gary Lowe. For the last three months, I've been serving in the position of Director of Expertising for the American Philatelic Society. Uh, before that, uh, I was playing the role of postal historian, writing frequently for all kinds of uh, philatelic publications. I'm still doing that, although um, they prefer, they being the APS, prefers that I write for them, which I'm happy to do as well. So you see my monthly column on expertizing, which is called, by no coincidence, Adventures in Expertizing, which is the topic of today's talk. But more to the point, it's Adventures in Expertizing and Why You Should Care. All right, today we're going to be exploring a few things like what is expertizing? And then that point that I was just making, why should you care? I will tell you a bit about the American Philatelic Expertization Service, APEX, our view of what expertizing um, needs to be, really. I'll give you a really quick overview of some of the easy to understand historic basic tools of the trade. And uh, I'll talk about expertizing inverted jennies. Very popular stamp, even though only a hundred of them ever existed. But there's, a, there's an ethos, there's a mythology to the inverted jennies that always gets excitement going. I don't care how often you read about them, you always want to read about them. Um, I'll talk about three episodes in my three months on the job, three episodes with uh, expertizing inverted jennies, or almost expertizing inverted jennies. Um, then I'll give you an example of what happens when experts disagree. When we issue a certificate, the things that are written on there are called an opinion. There are no facts in philately anymore, apparently, than anywhere else in life nowadays. But uh, certainly, we don't propose to issue things that are guaranteed to be scientific facts. I think we can get closer than we do now, but I'll show you an example of um, what happens when experts uh, disagree. And that will lead me very naturally into my last point, which will be the future of expertizing. So expertizing is a process that yields three different and distinct determinations. The identity of the stamp. Basically, that's defined by one or more catalog numbers. Here in the United States, it's generally speaking the Scott catalog number. In other nations, in the British Empire, it's Stanley Gibbons. In Europe, there are several major issuers of stamp catalogs. In addition to which, there are literally hundreds of specialized catalogs for very narrow areas within philately. Um, sometimes what shows up as a single number, for example, in the Scott catalog, could just as easily be three or 12 different categories of stamp in the more specialized catalog. So one of the things we've started doing since I jumped on board is to put the major catalog, catalog uh, number first. It's a Scott 123, but it's also a specialized catalog 123W or whatever. So we're trying to add information content and I'll explain uh, why, why we do that. But identifying the stamp is the first job of the members of our expert committee. Authenticity of the stamp is the second part. Um, is it genuine? Doesn't have to be genuine the stamp that the person who submitted it thinks it is, but is it real or has it been faked in some ways? Uh, is it a forgery? With modern material, is it a counterfeit? And there's a difference between a forgery and a counterfeit. Forgery is intended to steal from we philatelists. Um, counterfeit stamps are intended to steal 
from a postal authority. The Chinese are doing a wonderful job of importing into the United States flag over something stamps, just contemporary stamps, in the amount of, oh, let's estimate between 50 million and 300 million dollars a year worth of counterfeit stamps come into the United States from China just to wreak havoc with the finances of the United States Postal Service. So is the stamp genuine? Is it forged to fool us? Is it counterfeit to steal from uh, the post office? Condition is the third aspect of uh, what our experts are expected to determine. I break the kind of condition aspects we talk about into two categories. Naturally occurring events, toning is an obvious example, a tear, um, is generally naturally occurring. It's unintentional. It wasn't by design that it was put there. I would contrast that with what I call intentional events, trimmed or added perfs, repairs that are done, which may not be uh, for illicit purposes, but if it's disclosed as a repair, uh, then it's a perfectly, or may well be a, a perfectly legitimate thing to do. So you've got those three aspects, identity, authenticity, and condition, um, the results of which are a certificate, which is the final report that we issue. Hopefully it's the final report, but it's certainly the initial report that we issue uh, about the stamp uh, or the cover to send to the owner. And by the way, I add stamp and cover because as a postal historian, I care a lot about covers. I care about used envelopes as much as the stamps that are on them. And it's important, increasingly important, with the growing ease of being able to fake um, not just stamps, but the covers themselves. It's increasingly important that owners of uh, postal artifacts, including covers, submit them if they think they are valuable and they are interested in determining whether they're real. Submit those as well. So. Uh, over the coming months and years, uh, we at Apex are going to be promoting the idea of getting your covers authenticated, submitted uh, for expertizing. I will tell you it is a whole different discipline. The expertise required to determine the legitimacy of a stamp, one set of skills. We have an expert committee of close to 200 members now, 180 some. Um, who know all about stamps. Not all of them are in a position or are willing to opine on stamps on cover, on envelopes. Different set of disciplines, different ways of cheating philatelists, and not everybody is in a position to do that. So I'm, I'm seeking, as we expand our expert committee, to take us forward on the postal history side of philately. I s I'm biased, but I s think postal history represents a major future aspect of the hobby. We need to be in a position to opine with great authority on the legitimacy of the postal artifacts that we call covers. Um, we get in at Apex somewhere between four and 5,000 uh, applications for certificates each year. Uh, I won't say that this is a typical day's mail, but um, if you get rid of this box over here, that might well be. That's what was in the box. That was uh, one client of ours submitting 160 some applications. Um, that was the largest single submission that he has sent to us, but not by a lot. We have a number of clients that are collectors. They're not dealers. We've got dealer users, dealer clients as well. But we've got a number of clients that are collecting stamps and covers that send in 50 to 100 
items a month for expertizing. Um, this particular package came from an individual who lives in Japan, although the mailing address that he uses is domestic. How he gets them between the two nations is something I probably don't want to know. <laughs> but, uh, but he gets them here, and we opine on them. And he's pretty good. And uh, by pretty good, I'm talking about the accuracy of his identification of what it is he thinks he owns. On the other side of the trans transaction process, this is um, not a typical day but um, not an uncommon occurrence. These are um, certificates that are being returned to us from our members of our expert committee. And you can see that the transmissions are all certified. A client of ours can mail material to us in any postal or other delivery service um, level of service they want from first class to registered and anything in between. We send them out to the expert committee. The expert committee sends them back to us, always certified or registered, depending on the number of certificates we're sending out and expecting back or the implied value. If I'm sending out a $10,000 or $100,000 stamp, and I've been doing that, amazingly enough, um, I want to make sure it's registered. There are all kinds of questions nowadays about the uh, security of registered mail, and we debate whether it makes any sense to do that, and I'm doing a lot of uh, statistical studies to determine whether it makes sense to spend the extra bucks for registered mail based on what the post office is telling us about the problems they're having with registered. But be that as it may, when I came on board, our policy was certified or registered, depending on certain criteria. I'm not about, uh, I'm not ready just yet to change that. Um, but when these individual certificate requests, these forms come in, one of the questions they have to fill in is, what do you think your stamp is? What's the identity? Basically, what's the catalog number? We ask them two questions. What catalog are you using? By default, it's Scott, but if it's a foreign country, then they may choose some other catalog. And within that catalog, what catalog number do you believe it to be? That's the starting point for the expert committee. What's interesting, and Im this is why you should care, approximately 40 to 45 percent of the forms misidentify the stamp. They don't get it right. Half of those are simply I know what the picture is, I know what the image is, but there are multiple stamps in the catalog with that same image. Invariably, invariably, the owners get it wrong and they always pick the higher value stamp. I'm not sure why that is. There, there must be some underlying reason, but uh, there perhaps it's just the inherent optimism of, of philatelists. I'm sure it has something to do with that. In any event, um, if half of them, approximately half of those uh, misidentifications are, they just get the wrong catalog number for the picture, the rest of it involves altered or forged stamps. So maybe 20 or 25 percent of the material that comes into us is bad stuff. That's why you should care. If you've got stamps that you think are valuable or it's a stamp you're considering buying or even if you're considering selling it, getting a cert, now obviously I'm biased, I run a service that sells that, that, uh, that item called a certificate, but it's my contention that it's always in your best interest to know what it is you have or you're considering buying or considering selling. Um, so our view of expertizing comes down um, to this. The mission of APEX 
is to offer services that educate APS members and the philatelic community regarding the identity, authenticity, and condition of the stamps and covers they own or are considering purchasing. But the key word here is educate. The American Philatelic Society is a 501c3, not-for-profit, educational institution. We educate our members and the philatelic community at large. My role at Apex is to make sure that our certificates fulfill that larger mission of the entire organization by expertizing, by uh, educating the folks that submit their stamps for uh, authentication. Um, very simple, both simple in principle and almost as simple in practice. One of the things I'm doing is adding content to our certificates. It's not just about it's catalog number this, it's mint or used or unused or used. We don't use the word mint. Um, it's genuine and here's the condition about it. Yes, we still say that, but increasingly we are issuing supplemental reports that tell the owners or prospective owners of this material more about their stamps. For advanced users, for advanced collectors, we can get into very fine detail what, what plate is it from, what position on the plate, um, all kinds of important information. If you're dealing with a $10,000 stamp, the identification of the stamp itself is pretty simple. What plate it's from, what position it is, can have a huge difference, a huge influence on the, in, in catalog value. So we want to educate the owners of this material what it is they truly have. Um, let me talk a bit about some of the tools of the trade, and let me start with a historical perspective. This is the, the box top from a watermark tray going back to the 1930s. Let me, uh, let me blow that up for you. Directions for use. Place the stamp face down in the glass receptacle, pour on a few drops of carbona or carbonic or uh, carbon tetrachloride, just enough to moisten the stamp. You do that often enough and you're going to have lung cancer. That's a carcinogen. That's what we started off using now. You know, that if you're going to put an unused stamp with gum on the back into a watermark tray, you can't put water on it. It'll work. Water is just fine for revealing a watermark. Also removes the gum. Not a good solution. So they, they looked for uh, fluids that didn't dissolve the gum, and uh, carbon tetrachloride, carbon tet, was one of the first that they, uh, they came up with. There have been some improvements since then. Clarity is a commonly available watermark fluid. Um, some folks insist on using Ronsonol lighter fluid. It's not only bad to breathe, but um, it's, it's been known to support flames. That's the job. It's lighter fluid. Yeah. Oh, um, Clarity, I, I think it's, I don't know, <laughs> does it say what it is on the? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> um, I can tell you this, it was developed in the 90s by uh, Ken Lawrence, a pretty well-renowned philatelist, and several other members of the American Philatelic Society for our own internal use. But since we weren't in the uh, chemical business, the formula was given to the producer of Clarity, and they now sell it publicly. Yep. 
Yeah. yeah. Tells you what it doesn't contain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's uh Yes, that's that's in that's intended to disclose nothing and make you feel good. Um Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, and, and and we certainly have enough chemists in the hobby who can figure that out. Um, the formula was was developed and refined by Ken Lawrence and a few other philatelists at the APS, and then turned over um, to the manufacturer of this item. So it was developed originally for APS internal use. And then given freely um, to the uh, to the philatelic community. I mean, you still have to buy the product, but we don't make any money from it uh, from its development or anything else. Um, the watermark fluid. There are many different kinds on the market. Uh, we use this internally. I will tell you, when it comes to nursing the image of a watermark out of a uh, stamp. It is not uncommon for members of our expert committee to be using multiple different varieties of watermark fluid. There's an art. In addition to the science of developing the fluid, there's an art to watermarking. And um, using a variety of fluids is one way of practicing that art. Another way is to use devices like the Cygniscope. I think that's two or three hundred bucks nowadays. It works wonderfully on some stamps. It works not at all on others, depending on how the paper was manufactured and how the, um, how the watermark was impressed into uh, the surface, the, uh, the back surface, surface, obviously, of the paper. Um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good. Depending on what you collect, you could love it, hate it, regret having purchased it, or be very thankful. Um, at the other extreme, and this is not traditional at all, despite what, what this slide says, um, the Video Spectral Comparator 6000, the VSC 6000, one of the things that it does very, wor very well is reveal watermarks. You happen to have a spare hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you too can have one. Assuming that you could figure out how to use it. Um, takes a bit of training. This is ours, thank goodness. Uh, it was a gift very recently from an anonymous donor who as far as I personally am concerned, as you will see later is by that donation going to change the future, um, not just of expertizing, but of a lot of philately, because of what we're going to be doing with this device. But at a minimum, it's just a wonder for revealing, um, revealing watermarks. In addition to watermarks, there are other things that sometimes we're called upon to do one of which is lifting stamps from covers or removing hinges because sometimes you can't make out the watermark. Well, when it's on cover, you definitely can't make out the watermark, but sometimes a hinge remnant will interfere with the identification of a watermark. So we are um, we're in a position where we have to ask the permission of the owner of the stamp or cover, can we lift? the stamp or remove the hinge. It's extremely safe the way our experts do it, but nothing is totally risk-free, so we ask them to uh, hold us not liable in the event that something goes south. And we've had occasions where, uh, just recently had one, where uh, a stamp was mounted, glued down on an album page and it could be a very valuable stamp. It's glued down, it's in terrible condition. Uh, we got permission from the owner to remove it so we could make a positive identification. And 
all of the experts who do this lifting work for us declined to do it, and we issued a no opinion certificate. It was just too risky. That stamp was about to fall apart, and I don't care how you floated it off, it wasn't going to be safe enough. Um, discretion, be discretion being the better part of valor, we decided not to use this space age tool, which is how you lift stamps. This is a piece of Tupperware with three sponge segments. That's a grill that fits over the top. There it is, fully assembled, very high tech. You moisten those three sponges. You place the stamp or cover on top on the grill. You seal it with that little blue cap. You let it sit for 24 hours. The humidity goes to 100% in there, and you can lift very easily, very safely. If you are in the mood, I don't know, that there, I mean, there'd be no reason why you would want to lift a stamp from an envelope, but you might have reason to remove a very ugly um, hinge remnant from a stamp. That's the way to do it, folks. Okay. One of the other tools in our arsenal is our reference collection. Every expert on our committee has a specialized reference collection of the stamps from their area. Um, that includes legitimate stamps and known fakes and forgeries. They need to be able to compare the stamp against multiple different varieties of the same stamp, different shades and colors to identify what it is. Um, they need to be able to discriminate between uh, legitimate stamp and a forgery, and having your own uh, reference collection is one of the requirements for participating in the expert committee. Uh, you also need to have a uh, reference library of all the specialized books and publications. If you're an expert in the field, you've got that already. That's how you get to be an expert, I think. Um, anyway, we have our own reference collection at APS. We have for years been saying we've got 500 different volumes in our reference collection. Um, close-up of some of the Scots International albums. Turns out we've got 500 of these green volumes. But our reference collection includes some 1,400 different volumes, um, whether they are stamp albums or um, um, stock books or collections of sheets that were uh, you know, stamp pages that were donated to us, somewhere between five and seven million dollars at market value. So I think it's one of the most powerful reference collections in the world. And the Queen's stamp collection certainly is a much nicer one than, than we have when it comes to the British Empire. But you don't have to have good stamps. You don't have to have pretty fine condition stamps from the standpoint of expertizing. If you've got a stamp and it's genuine, I don't care how ugly it is, it can be used for comparison purposes. And I'll show you an example of what comparisons look like in a bit. Um, le let me turn to, I started off by saying this was about adventures in expertizing. Let me, let me talk about um, adventures with the inverted Jenny. Okay, so I've been on the job three months now, a little over. My first day on the job, I get a phone call. I think we have an inverted Jenny. I thought for sure somebody on staff was pulling my leg. Guaranteed. My first day on the job, that's going to be a, a, a phone call I get? Anyway, um, um, let, let me say it was from an aviation museum that had a collection of airmail stamps. And that's a picture that they sent us of their magic stamp. And they, they showed they had uh, the regular C3, the uninverted Jenny, and a few others. Um, and there's a, there's a blow up of it. 
a lousy, it wasn't a scan, it was a camera photograph. Um, considering it was an aviation museum, strikes me as, as uh, interesting that they couldn't figure out how to use a phone camera a little bit better. That's what they sent us. Um, there was all kinds of adventures, because these folks, when they, when they realized what they had, because some, some visitor came in and said, oh, you realize that's an inverted Jenny? That's an expensive stamp. Hang it on a wall. You know. Not protected. Not, you know, just like in a picture frame, along with six other stamps. All of a sudden, they got concerned. I've got a $450,000 stamp hanging on my wall. They put it in the safe deposit box, and it took us weeks of negotiation to convince them to drive it from where they were to Omaha, which is where Stamp Show was this past summer. They brought it in. We had one of our experts on site. We were, you know, expecting bands and, and all sorts of, publi you know, we were going to do this whole publicity thing. P.S. I mean, these were very innocent people. They, nobody was looking to put anything over on anybody. They wanted confirmation from an expert that they had what they thought they had. Been hanging on a wall since 1990. Okay. Um, as it turns out, it wasn't, not only wasn't it an inverted Jenny, it wasn't even a stamp. The guy who donated it to him, I'm sure in all innocence, because he was putting together a display, had cut it out of a catalog. It was a, <laughs> so that was my first adventure in serious expertizing of, you know, of monster material. Um, but it wasn't my last in the three months that, that I've been there. Because here, a month later, this shows up. Shows up first as a scan before as a stamp. Um, that's the, the back end of it. This one looks pretty real. So it's got the, the straight edge across the top. So you know it's from the top row. At least you hope it's from the top row. Um, and we were able to verify that this was position 7 from the original sheet of 100. Right, so the seventh one on the first row. And um, there's a website called um, invertedjenny.com, appropriately named, from which... I can show you the provenance of that stamp from the day that Mr. Roby bought it from the post office and sold it to a stamp dealer named Klein, the whole sheet for $15,000. Uh, Klein turned around and sold it to Colonel Green, rather famous stamp collector, the entire sheet. $20,000, and you can see subsequent auctions, and then a private treaty, and another auction where this stamp changed hands. It was sold last in 1998, um, 23rd of October, at which point the public lost sight of it. Nobody knows. Well, somebody knows, but nobody's saying um, who the buyer at the shrinks uh, at the Shreves sale was. Turned out that buyer was a dealer, and sold it. Private treaty. I will tell you at a nice profit to um, a private collector, who is now the owner of it, and who we've been dealing with, and to whom we will be issuing. A genuine certificate. All right, so this is my third, um, or my second, rather, uh, adventure with a C3A. The third is with the one that we own. I did not realize when I took the job that uh, sitting 18 feet from my shoulder was an inverted Jenny. There's a little safe sitting there, and I wasn't paying much attention to it, but got a C3A and a few other 
delightfully valuable stamps in there. Um, Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, in 1955, this block of four, we only have a black and white photograph of it, was on display in an exhibit, and it was stolen. A woman by the name of Mrs. McCoy was the owner, and this is the McCoy block you are looking at. And... Um, Turns out that the block was broken up into four individual stamps and doctored to hide the fact. The stamps were doctored, basically ruined, if you will. Um, yeah, that's too strong a term. They were not improved in the breaking up of, those uh, of that block to hide the identity, uh, which if noth nothing else proves that the folks who stole it weren't very sophisticated because slicing a block of four into individual stamps, and even if you're looking to play with the perfs and whatever else they were thinking of doing, doesn't change the identity of the underlying stamp. Each one of the stamps on that sheet were readily identifiable because before the sheet was broken up, each of the positions was photographed um, very close so that the details were available. Anybody can play any of the Jennies today. You, if you come into one, you won't have a problem identifying which one it is you've come into. All right? Um, but um, three of the four have been recovered. Mrs. McCoy was, was paid by the insurance company in a policy that gave her the right of reclamation. If the stamps were recovered, they'd be the property of the insurance company who paid her, except that her policy said, if the stamps are found, you can buy them back from us for what we paid you uh, under the insurance policy. Before her death, uh, Mrs. McCoy willed that property right, the right of recovery, to the American Philatelic Society. Any of these stamps come up, we could buy it from the insurance company. Time passed, a long time passed, and the insurance company is no longer in business. As these stamps are recovered, they are property of the American Philatelic Society. Three of them have been recovered. Um, this one, position 65, is the one you see here. That's the one we retained. The two others that have been recovered have been sold off. One was used to pay down one of the mortgages on the American Philatelic uh, Research Library. I forget what the other what the funds were, uh, what funds were used for for the other one. But uh, um, in any event, we just own uh, this one now. We're hoping someday to recover the fourth. Uh, the third actually was recovered uh, in, in a very interesting story that made the news in 2016. It was turned over to us by the FBI uh, at the Javits Center at the International Show in 2016. Uh, all of these stories are in a number of books on the, uh, on the Jenny, so if you're really curious about them, you can, uh, you can read any of those books. In any event, uh, I decided it was time to, uh, to get our own Jenny a brand new certificate. One of the things we recommend is that if your certificate is over five years old, it's time for a refresh. That's not just us marketing all over again. The idea is that technology changes. We get smarter about things. We learn more about fakes and forgeries over time. And it's a good idea to get your stamps recertified if the cert is more than five years old. If the cert's more than five years old, and you're thinking about buying that stamp at auction, you want a new cert. You want a new cert. Um, so um, 
one of two members of our expert committee is local. That's Ken Lawrence. And um, we brought him and one other member of our expert committee together. Uh, but here we see, uh, actually, here we see Ken examining RC3A. He's doing basic blocking and tackling, like watermarking it. Looking at it under a high power magnification. And then filling in the form so that we could issue ourselves a certificate. Um, fortunately, uh, Ken pronounced our, our own Jenny genuine, which pleased us no end. Um, but what happens, and now we had two experts. I can tell you for anything of that price or close to that price, anything above $2,500 in catalog value, we get more than one uh, opinion from the expert committee. And if I get two and they don't agree, I'll get a third. The last thing I want to do is adjudicate between two experts. So I'll get a third. The forms that we use have columns for five sets of opinions. In the past, we've gone as high as 10. If something is important and something is disputed, we'll get to the bottom of it with all the expert power we have. But what happens when experts disagree? We got this stamp in um, from somebody who's planning on buying it. Um, we pronounced it a genuine Scott number 154 with a catalog value of $4,000. He didn't pay that much for it, but based on our opinion, our certificate, he went ahead and bought it. For uh, reasons known only to him, it was sent to a competitive expertising service who pronounced it a 165, which is a darn similar stamp. It's the identical image. Um, got a catalog value of $2,400. Our client was understandably upset. With us. Can't say I blame them. Um, we s and he wants a refund. And I, again, don't blame him. Um, what we do in situations like that is reevaluate the work that we did by sending it to a series of other experts. From our Reference collection, here's a 154, here's a 165, here's the stamp that was submitted for expertizing. You see it on both a black and a white background for all kinds of you know, comparative reasons. I don't know. In the top one, it looks closer to what our opinion was, and the bottom one looks closer to the competitive opinion. Um, we sent it out to two experts. Both agreed with our original finding. But it wasn't about the shade of the ink. It was the paper type that was the ultimate determinant. The original stamp was on a thinner, looser paper. And... The 165, the newer, was on a thicker paper. And you could just take the stamp with tongs and go like this against your fingers and feel the difference between this stamp, 154, in our collection, and this stamp, um, the 165, in our collection. So... Not a very sophisticated technique, but the shades don't tell the complete story. Um, um, those were used as well, yes. Excellent question. Yeah, no, precisely. Uh, the thickness of the paper can be determined using um, highly sensitive micrometers, because you're talking about 
difference of thickness between two pieces of paper, um, not between paper and cardboard. Um, what these kinds of disputes, and this is far from the only one, because again, they're opinions, right? But these kinds of disputes point to the fact that we need to continue to improve the processes and procedures that we use. So the future of expertizing, in a phrase, is analytical philately. The use of scientific tools to study paper, ink, and, uh, and other things. That new VSC 6000 we have is the ideal tool for doing a spectral analysis. You bounce different light beams off the surface of the stamp. You record it. Um, not just in the visible, visible light spectrum, but the infrared and the ultraviolet as well. When you do that, you get a map of the stamp's reflectivity characteristic. And that lets you compare. Remember, the C in VSC is comparator. That lets you compare different, in our case, stamps. This is a device that's used by the FBI to make sure that passports are genuine or that, that, that the currency is genuine. Because you can test ink, you can test paper. You can see removed watermarks in our, uh, not watermarks, uh, cancellations. All right. So there are a variety of different uses for the VSC 6000. But in terms of an arsenal of tools to be used, there are, there are things like uh, X-ray diffraction, XRF. I'm sorry, that would be XRD. XRF is X-ray fluorescence, which will help you determine the elements, not the chemical compounds, uh, at least as far as uh, XRF is concerned, but um, the elemental and chemical composition of the paper or the ink. These are not $100,000 tools, but they're multi-$10,000 tools. And I am hoping that we will be adding them um, to our toolkit in the not too distant future. There's other um, scientific um, equipment available. FTIR, which is Fourier Transform Infrared, and is another advanced technique uh, for getting into the heart of um, what your stamp is composed of. And um, we've got the VSC 6000. We're, uh, we're $100,000 closer to our goal. Of introducing the American Analytical Philately Laboratory. I hope to have it operational within the next year. We're off to a good start with that contribution. There are many organizations that have tools like these. Training consists of learning how to use the features of, an, uh, uh, of a device like the VSC 6000. But just because you have a scientific tool doesn't mean you're going to get better results. Why? If I know how to use the features, that doesn't mean that I have a basic understanding of the scientific method. It doesn't mean that um, I know how to interpret the results. I can generate data till the cows come home. If I don't understand it any better than the cows, it doesn't make a difference. So it's not about generating data. It's about interpretation of results. That takes a different kind of training and a very different kind um, of expertise. That's what we're going to be developing. We are not going to be doing junk science with our science tools. And that's why you should care about expertizing. Thank you, folks. <laughs> Questions? Comments? Objections. Reference drawing that I have assembled 
Love to. Okay. Yes. Can you accept individual research? Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things I didn't m mention about our reference collection is that in addition to having the APRL, which with its f four miles of bookshelves <laughs> sitting 150 paces from me, in addition to that, we have our own specialized reference library, including a vertical file, two file cabinets worth of vertical files of articles that go back a long time because just because it's old doesn't mean it's wrong or bad or naive. Sometimes it does, but not always. We've got a complete reference library, a, a thorough reference library, to assist us and the members of our expert committee in doing the research necessary to get to the bottom of the, the trickier items. And um, stamps that we wouldn't opine on in the past because they were so difficult. Overprints in particular are so easy to forge uh, and you don't have to use a, uh, a modern printer, a laser printer, to get those forged images onto a stamp. There are more sophisticated ways of doing it. We back away from a lot of opinions because it's just too uncertain. With the VSC 6000 and other tools, we'll be able to compare inks on the overprints and have a great deal of confidence that what's being submitted to us is legitimate or not. Yeah? What's the uh, uh, price range for the Sacred Heart Certificate? Okay, for members, um, certificate starts at $20 or anything under $200 in catalog value. Um, ab above, a, it's $25, under $500. It's $30 for catalog value of 1000 or less. Above a thousand bucks, it's three percent. Non-members really need to be members. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to tell you? Uh, th that that was a marketing statement, by the way. What else? Anything else? Yeah. How long have you had this uh, this VSC six thousand? <laughs> Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> okay. So my my certificate from January was not uh, part of this thing. Um. As soon as we start using it seriously and not experimentally, yeah. um, we will be issuing, and we are already issuing, supplemental reports that are not part of the certificate but contain information that the expert committee has reported back to us. Uh, it's not part of the cert because we don't want it part of the guarantee. Mm -hmm. I should have mentioned, this is my bad, I should have mentioned APS is the only certifying organization that guarantees its work. Otherwise, that dispute that I showed you about, I wouldn't have worried about so much. But we're on the line because we guarantee our opinions. So, um, yeah, we'll be issuing supplemental reports for things like using the VSC 6000. I think I'm out of time. I'm getting that look. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not that look. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you mentioned about all the uh, uh, stamps that uh, China uh, sends in with the comic book there. Is, are they doing anything at all? Is there any way they can stop that? Um, how do you stop smuggling? You, you do a lot of hard work. The, uh, um, the U.S. Postal Inspectors Service, a bunch of guys you know, with, with heat on their hips, wandering around, uh, making arrests. We estimate, they estimate, between uh, 50 million and 300 million based on s some assumption about what they, what they actually capture and what percentage of the total that might be. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really open to a lot of speculation. But, yeah, they work very hard. Um, and, of course... You work backwards, because if these stamps aren't always tagged effectively like the modern stamps are, so if it goes through a canceling machine, it, it, it flunks because it isn't tagged, they will work backwards and find out who sent that envelope, 
where they bought that stamp, some bodega somewhere, and they will work their way backwards. Um, six, eight years ago, there was a big capture. I forget, I think it was 20 or $22 million worth of stamps. 20 or $22 million. There was a trucking network that was bringing this stuff all the way across the country, all the way around the country. There's bad people out there. Don't have the interests of uh, our government or our post office at heart. So. I think you mentioned in Lynn's recently about how you go online yep. and order at so easily. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. eBay is rife with discount postage that's counterfeit. Absolutely. And then you look at the North Koreans and they have some of the best printing services in the world. Yeah, yeah. Another good example. But the Chinese have the volume. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I think I got to go. Thank you, folks. I appreciate your attention.